Hey guys, my name is Brandon, and in today's reading notes lecture video, we're going to be going over how to understand and how to perform well on the SAT reading science passage. So first of all, to give you guys a roadmap of sort of what we'll be talking about today, I'll start off with some general pointers, uh, some general things to expect when you encounter a science passage. And then um, I'll go into some tactics, some techniques that you can uh, use to help you improve your performance. And as always, we'll wrap up with an analysis of a science passage from a previous SAT. And as always, the questions that go along with the passage I analyze will be included in the notes. So I really encourage you guys to do that in your own time. So let's just get started. Um, so first off, what to expect. So the science passage is sort of this technical and methodical passage on the SAT reading section. Typically, the science passage will talk about maybe a scientific discovery, a scientific phenomenon. It might talk about a new research project, or it might talk about a new study that's being conducted. Um, science passages are usually um, very frequently single passages, but at the same time, it is also possible that um, you get a science passage that's a double passage. So it's really important that you understand not only the difference between those, but you understand how to you know, approach both of these different types of science passages. So now I'll just talk about some of the tips that I have uh, for tackling the science passage from my own experience. And the first one is identifying the main ideas. Main ideas in the science passage typically include you know, d the main discoveries, the hypothesis, um, the experiments, and maybe the results of the studies. So these four topics, at least in my experience, what I found was that they make up you know, the basic structure, the skeleton um, of any science passage. Um, and my advice for this is as you sort of read the passage, you should look to underline, to highlight these main ideas. Because what you often find is that the questions won't be centered around you know, these specific uh, scientific ideas, but rather they'll be centered around um, more broad and general topics, such as the discoveries, the hypotheses, experiments, and the results. So by understanding these you know, four broad topics well, you're really setting yourself up well to answer the questions. Um, and sort of going along with that, my second tip is, main ideas are always gonna be greater than details in these passages. You know, a lot of science passages will talk about specific science methodology, you know, a specific experiment, specific scientific technicalities, specific scientific jargon. And you might not understand every single word that the passage is saying. But, um, you know, you sort of have to be okay with that. You have to understand that as long as you're getting the main ideas down, as long as you understand the main ideas and the main flow of the passage, you should be okay with not understanding these small things because ultimately these small things won't matter as much when you're um, answering the questions. Um, it's important to remember that, you know, all of these science passages, they aren't testing you on whether you know the science concepts, whether you know how... Um, you know, this study um, happened, how you, whether you know uh, how like this study contributed to the discovery of XYZ. It doesn't test you on your scientific knowledge. It tests you on your ability to read the passage and your ability to answer questions based on what you did in your reading. It's more about reading comprehension rather than science. So you shouldn't be focused too much on the small details. And of course, I feel like I always talk about this in every single video I do every week, but my last tip is to just, you know, practice by doing. Um, it's really just the most important thing that I can say on any topic because there is no replacement to good practice. So to sort of familiarize yourself with the unique language and the unique, you know, a flow of scientific writing, um, I recommend that you look into science articles like Scientific American, the New York Times Science section, the Washington Post Science section. Read those and sort of familiarize yourself with how scientific writers write and um, what, you know, how they sort of flow in their writing um, so that you can, you know, sort of understand uh, not only how they work, but you can sort of apply this comprehension to when you're actually taking the SAT. And of course, um, beyond that, beyond just reading science passages, 
Um, there's also a lot of you know, outside resources available to practice just only um, science passages such as uh, Khan Academy, U World, by now you probably already know of those already. So um, with that said, let's just move on to our analysis of this science passage that we have here. This passage is adapted from J.D. Watson and F.H.C. Crick, Genetical Implications of the Structure of Deoxyribonucleic Acid, so DNA. Um, Watson and Crick deduced the structure of DNA using evidence from Rosalind Franklin and R.G. Gosling's X-ray crystallography diagrams of DNA and from Erwin Shargraf's data on the base composition of DNA. Okay, the chemical formula of deoxy deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, is now well established. So this is sort of uh, one of the main ideas that we talked about, sort of this scientific discovery. They're saying at the beginning of the passage that the chemical formula, you know, sort of the molecular basis of DNA is now well established. So that's sort of a main idea of this passage. The molecule is a very long chain, the backbone of which consists of a regular alternation of sugar and phosphate groups. To each sugar is attached a nitrogenous base, which can be of four different types. Two of the possible bases, adenine and guanine, are purines, and the other two, thymine and cytosine, are pyrimidines. So far as is known, the sequence of bases along the chain is irregular. The monomer unit, consisting of phosphate, sugar and base is known as a nucleotide. Um, so here, sort of scientific jargon, um, as long as we can identify, you know, adenine and guanine as purines, thymine and cytosine as pyrimidines, then I think we should be good to go here. The first feature of our structure, which is of biological interest, okay, so this is indicative of a main idea because it's the first feature that is of biological interest. So we really need to take note of this feature of interest is that it consists not of one chain, but of two. So DNA is not um, a single helix structure, it's a double helix structure. These two chains are both coiled around a common fiber axis. It has often been assumed that since there was only one chain in the chemical formula, there would only be one in the structural unit. However, the density taken with X-ray uh, evidence suggests very strongly that there are two. So X-ray evidence, X-ray crystallography evidence, indicates that there are um, you know, two helixes, not just one. Okay, the other biologically important feature, so in addition to this first feature of interest that we've already identified in the previous passage, there's actually a second one. So this is also another main idea that we have to uh, sort of understand. The other biologically important feature is the manner in which the two chains are held together. So sort of this interaction between the two chains is also important to um, the overall structure of DNA. This is done by hydrogen bonds between the bases. Okay, so hydrogen bonds is what um, allows these two chains to interact. The bases are joined together in pairs, a single base from one chain being hydrogen bonded to a single base from another. The important point is that only certain pairs of bases will fit into the structure. Okay, this is, seems important. One member of a pair must be a purine. Okay, so purine, let's just refresh what that was. A purine is adenine or guanine. One member of the pair must be a purine and the other a pyrimidine. Pyrimidine meaning thymine and cytosine. So we see here another key sort of, not a scientific finding, but sort of a rule or a certain rule of uh, DNA pairing. And that rule is that a purine must be paired with a pyrimidine. So this is also very important to note. Um, in order to bridge between these two chains. If a pair consisted of two purines, for example, there would be no room for it. We believe that the bases will be present almost entirely in their most probable forms. If this is true, the conditions for forming hydrogen bonds are more restrictive, and the only pairs of bases possible are adenine with thymine, guanine with cytosine. Okay, so there are further restrictions, as this paragraph says, of the pairing of the nitrogenous bases. So we really have to be able to identify that, you know, that this process is restrictive and the only pairs possible are adenine with thymine and guanine with cytosine. Adenine, for example, can occur in either chain, but when it does, its partner on the other chain must always be thymine. So adenine always pairs with thymine, again. The phosphate sugar backbone of our model is completely regular, but any sequence of the pairs of bases can fit into the structure. It follows that in a long molecule, many different permutations are possible, 
and it is there and it therefore seems likely that the precise sequence of bases is the code which carries the genetical information. So sort of the permutations of the nitrogenous bases, the difference, the mixing of the nitrogenous bases is the code, is the sort of building blocks for genetical information. If the actual order of the bases on one of the pairs of chains were given, one could write down the exact order of the bases on the other one because of the specific pairing. This is true. So for example, if on one chain we had um, adenine followed by guanine, then we know that on the second chain it must be thymine followed by cytosine. Because once again, as we read in this paragraph, the rule is that adenine must be paired with thymine and guanine must be paired with cytosine. Okay, thus one chain is, as it were, the complement of the other. Okay, this is also key information. One chain is complementary to the other. And it is this feature with, which suggests how the deoxyribonucleic acid molecule might duplicate itself. So this is also kind of important because this sort of complementary manner that the two strands have is key information that's important to how DNA duplicates and DNA replicates within cells. And below we have a table, and this table seems to show sort of the um, amount, the relative amount of each of the nitrogenous bases in um, various organisms shown on the left. So um, that sort of concludes our analysis of this science passage. I really hope you guys found it helpful. And of course, um, to practice sort of answering questions, um, I have attached the reading questions that go along with this science passage in the notes. So um, be sure to do that in your own time. And of course, if you have any questions, leave a comment in Google Classroom, uh, message us in the messenger group, or you know, email us in powerprep2020 at gmail.com. Thanks. See you next week, guys.